Hey, what's up, everyone? This is your host, Jay Baker. And Irvin Johnson here today to bring you guys a new episode of Shining Spotlight. It's been a while since we've done one. Obviously, we're heading back into a new season, and we want to kick it off strong with a very special guest in the industry. He's done the comic Witch Doctor. He's been around for quite a while. He's even taught uh, classes at the College of Creative Studies here in Detroit. So we have a legend amongst us right now, ladies and gentlemen, that we want you guys to, to hear from and to, you know, ask him you know, about his journey in the industry creatively. He's been an inspiration to many. He's even been an inspiration specifically even to Che, you know, which I'm sure Che will probably share a story about that uh, while we're here today. But today we want to welcome the creator of Witch Doctor to the show, the great Kenji. Thank you so much for having coming on the day and speaking with all us. Right, we really right. appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me, man. Thank you for reaching out. So... One thing I want to know, like just from obviously from being in the industry for a long time and, you know, um, going through like the creative journey, what like I, one thing that I've, I've listened to an interview that you did with Witch Doctor that because for those of you who don't know a lot about Witch Doctor, there's there's, um, you know, obviously some, you know, voodoo inspiration in there. There's also um, um, the aspect of um, like with floods, you know, which I know it touches mm -hmm. on, you know, which mm -hmm. some people may think may be connected to um, um, like the Katrina and, you know, New Orleans and everything like that. But I heard when I was listening to one of the, an inter a previous interview that you did that that was actually a concept that you had before that even happened. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And, and what I've, what I've explained even back then was we, we knew, we knew what would happen when a, a category five storm ran through that town. Like we knew, we knew those levees would break and we knew that place would flood the, you know, that was, that wasn't, that wasn't prophecy. <laughs> like that was, that wasn't, that was, you know, that wasn't a revelation that, that was, that was something that was, a, was bound to happen. And, and when I, when I created the story, um, I was operating off of, you know, reports from the, you know, uh, the, 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 the army uh, engineers corps, uh, and and so we knew it was happening, and that and that was what I was planning. But the the difficulty was when I created the story, like just before I had released it, it actually happened, and it put me in a spot where I didn't want to make a book that looked like it was capitalizing off of a real life tragedy. Um, but yeah, it it was it was some real stuff. It was some real stuff, and and that is that has always been kind of the linchpin of the work that I do, like at least in, in the rain, in the realm of doing like what I call like black horror, uh, the, the stuff that I call horror, at least for black people comes from real places. The stuff that scares us is real stuff. Like not, you know, not boogeymen, but like real history and, and stuff that kind of digs into us and, and we kind of relive, uh, throughout our lives. Yeah. I noticed that as well reading. Um, and, I think art imitates life and the best of, of it the, does. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of creatives um, pull from that, especially black creatives. So I was wondering, like, how did you even get your start into coming up with the concept for Witch Doctor? So Witch Doctor, like for me, like visually, I, I there was a point where I wanted to just make a, a superhero with cornrows because we were very early on in the black comics realm. And there were, you know, there's the, the guy with the Afro, uh, which was, I think, Chocolate Thunder at the time. Uh, we, I was looking to make um, archetypes, uh, iconic kind of silhouettes for Black superhero -dom. Um, And I was kind of looking at a very small set of, like, the indie at the time. And what I basically wanted, like, as a kid, when I found Brother Man, for instance, and Brother Man was a big influence on me, but when I found Brother Man, I found it in a box of, you know, a bunch of other comic books. And there was some other comic books. Chocolate Thunder was in there. Dreadlocks was in there. Uh, a few of the Black comics. But what I had wanted to do coming up was I wanted to put a book in that box. I wanted to add to this collection of, of new kinds of comics. So visually, I just wanted to have a character that had cornrows. And what that led me to was the cultural significance of, of the cornrows. And that led me to 
hair braiding and, and where that comes from in Africa. And it led me to, to look at it from more of a pan-African perspective and how um, this guy's heritage and this guy's culture is literally kind of woven into his head. Um, and from that, it took me into how the culture and how the heritage is kind of like woven into his body, like his actual form, like his DNA. Um, and if you if you've read the story, that that's you know there's there's the good and the bad. You know there's there's there is the the power, and then there's also the pain that mm -hmm. is kind of woven into this character. Um, and all of that is meant to kind of draw the strings from black culture and black history, and and give you what I engineered as a a real black superhero, like the the. You know, I always thought that, uh, you know, Superman got his powers from coming from Krypton. He got his powers because he comes from another planet. Witch Doctor gets his powers literally from being a black man. It, it's in his blood. And um, that's both strength and weakness at the same time. That's both sanity and insanity at, at the same time. I mean, spoiler alert, if you've read the book, it literally right. drives him crazy. Like he gets, you know, flooded with the spirits of his ancestry and it drives him insane um so that's kind of where we start yeah that is correct i mean and the thing is it's so profound because it kind of shows the strength of the character but the trauma and the, him yes. actively working through it through the dialogue like if mm -hmm. you read when you read through which doctor you get to actually see the conversations he's having in his head and how he can use the pain use the trauma but he still has barriers even afterwards, still after effects. And it really shows like the continuous like journey, especially for black people specifically that's showing it up a black man. And, you know, that's what I think is very important. And I was just wondering how, were there any particular people in the industry that inspired you to create comics? Definitely people. I mean, um, there's, there's guys like, so, so, different guys for different reasons mm -hmm. and it's not just one person that, that led me to do it but i would say the first inspiration that i got was brother man was, was dawood anya buile because i had never seen anything like that you know i see i'd seen comic books sure this this book was a whole different size um and you opened it up and it was black and white and and it looked like like back in the day it, it reminded me of like a Fat Albert, like not Fat Albert, but like you remember like Fat Albert had the show and then he would have the Brown Hornet on it, right? Mm -hmm. Brown Hornet was like maybe like a five minute part of the whole Fat Albert show. Fat Albert show was like 30 minutes. Brown Hornet was like a five minute. But you would watch Fat Albert just for that five minutes of Brown Hornet. When I got this Brother Man comic, it was like I had a comic book out of that Fat Albert world. Like this was the type of book that they would be reading and it, it just... I don't know what can I can I do my it looked funky is 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 I'm the word I'm gonna use for it like back to like it just looked real street and it looked real 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 rich and flavorful even black and white it just looked real tasty and delicious and I and I really got into that so that was my inspiration for for how I wanted to approach books and how I wanted books my books to look because I in my perception, this is how black comics looked. It was only the first one I had seen, and I would I hadn't seen many, you know, even in the years past that, but this is what I thought black comics would look like. So if I'm gonna make one, I'm gonna make it look kind of like that. Then there's Andre. Andre, I mean, Dreadlocks is is amazing. It's a it's an iconic book, but more so is like dreadlocks is is a big thing, but Andre is a bigger thing. Like Andre's hustle is what inspires. Me. Just Andre, just the way he moves uh, with his business, the way he not not just with his book, but with the the way that he moves the movement itself um, has always inspired me, and and has always made me feel welcome in the game. Uh, so that, that's inspired me. But I don't know who else. Who else we got? Jibba, my man, uh, Jibba Mole Anderson, who did The Horseman. We worked side and side, side by side. Oh, yeah, the Horseman. Early on, we had a very um, friendly, uh, you know, competitive, like, 
because I had told him very early on, like your book is going to be because we were publishing it the same in the same company. I'm like, your book is going to be next to my books. We got to, you know, duke it out and, and, and keep leveling up on each other. So he's still in the game. And I, and that inspires me, too. And that's good to hear. And you young dudes, like you young dudes, like the one of the I'll tell you what I haven't I haven't technically published too much in the last couple of years. I did put out. Uh, well, two books. I put out uh, Open Fire and I put out Eye of the Storm. But I've been cool on not publishing because there's so many books out. There's so many books, so many, so many brothers making books out right now. And that's the, that's inspiring. That's inspiring. It does inspire me to, to come back out and, and show y'all something. So, so I guess I'm, I'm curious. curious. So, so of, course of course you had you um, your own um, like students that you've taught, you know, um, creatively and, you know, um, you've helped, you know, a lot of people level up. So have you seen any of your students get to the point where they're working on like any like major publications or anything like that? I, I have. I don't I don't know too intimately about it, but I know there's a guy that came up to me recently. He was about your age. He's in his 30s. Um, you gave me the same story. Like, yeah, you, you taught, you taught a class, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Um, and he's like a game developer now. And so there's a lot of these stories of, of, of kids that I taught one time, you know, and it was just that one spark kids that I met one time. And then 30 years later, they, you know, thankfully they, they kept doing it. They kept drawing. And that's, you, you guys know it because you, you have it in your heart because that's, it's not me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's not me that has to make you keep drawing. It has to really be something that's in your heart to just want to keep doing. Uh, Cause it gets rough. <laughs> it gets, it gets dry and it gets lonely sometimes, but you got to do it because that's what you do. Chase, and you want to share your, uh... yeah, I was getting ready to share my story. And, you know, before I share the story, I, that's definitely true. Like the, the journey of a creative has its ups and downs where it's very, very like you're passionate, but then because the creative process is an emotional, passionate process, if you're doing you're it right, if you do it right, if you, if it's organic, it comes, you know what I mean? At your own pace, like it's so many ebbs and flows in it. So I'm glad that you did touch on that. But one of my personal stories is I'm one of the young kids from maybe, maybe not quite 20, maybe 20 years ago, 20 years ago, who met Kenji one time through Andre Batts. And I have, uh, and I'm sorry, I wish I had this poster, but this was 20 years ago. I had a witch doctor poster that you came and you brought with Andre. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was really like, I always drew, like you said, it's in your heart. If you want to create, you're going to do it. But it's always good to see people who look like you because it becomes more obtainable. It's crucial. I, it's crucial. Yeah. And that was so I want to say thank you personally, because Absolutely. that was one of those defining moments for me as a creative. Like, oh, I can do this. Like, this is obtainable. This isn't reaching for the stars. This is I can use my voice for something. So thank you very much. Blessings and blessings. Um, it, it is crucial to see that when I was a kid, when I was coming up, I, I, I didn't even know, I didn't even know art was a job. You know, I didn't even know drawing was a job until I got around like, well, I was in college before I really realized I could draw for a living. And even that was more whimsical than, than an actual career path. Um, my career path came from me doing it. My career path came from me. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, one below uh, MC, told me once, uh, "You, you, you're, you're never gonna know you can fly until you jump. Like until you, until you jump off that ledge, you won't know that you can fly." Uh, and that's kind of the approach that I had for my career. Like I, I, I didn't know if I could make a living off of it if I kept devoting you know, 20, 40 hours of my, my life to, you know, a nine to five job and then being too, too tired to draw. So, um, but I didn't see that, that, that took a leap of faith. Uh, so it's crucial for not, a, not only for us to, to do the work, but to also kind of show, like reach back and show others uh, that the work is being done. And it doesn't always mean seeing me personally or seeing me physically. Sometimes you can just see the work, like, I think I got that inspiration from seeing Dawood's work, from seeing Brother Man, the book itself, 
and knowing that it wasn't it wasn't what I would see from Marvel or DC. It was something that had come pretty much from his hands. Um, and that was, you know, that was that whole indie comics era back then. So I followed that. And I was going to ask you one, I have, well, two part question. Uh, how long have you actually been in the industry and how did you actually get your start in the industry? I mean, so by the industry, you just mean publishing comics Publishing comics. Publishing comics. Uh, I want to say it's probably safe to say around 99 is where Witch Doctor first officially came out. No, there was another book before that. Now, three or four years before that, I had done a book called Eden with a uh, with a mm -hmm. internet development company that I was working for at the time. So that was published. Um, and that was kind of our first kind of like we dipped our toe into indie comics, but I would say like me independently, just doing it for myself, drawing it, writing it, my own thing uh, was like around 98, 99. When I started working with uh, Jibba Anderson and uh, Michael Larson, when we uh, started Griot comics. But okay. It, yeah. But the, and that was, so I, I primarily worked and still work independently. I've never been too obliged to work for the the majors or the mainstream. I've never really solicited that work. I've never felt it necessary. That's never really been what I wanted to do. Um, there have been offers that have come my way, some that I've accepted, some that I've declined. Um, some of the things that I've accepted, I did, but just never, you know, saw the light of day as those things apparently Apparently, that's how it happens, uh, which is why I don't too often work in that lane. Um, my work is also very personal, or at least that's what I prefer it to be. Um, like, if I'm spending a lot of time on it, it's probably personal. So uh, that's that's just where my, like, in terms of me saying I work in the industry, I work very independently. I've done some work for Marvel. I've done some work for uh, MTV. But it's all been work for hire. I wouldn't consider myself a Marvel Comics guy or a DC Comics guy. I'm, a, I'm an artist that, and my priority is my own storytelling. Right. And sometimes you might just take contr like contractual. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know what? All right, I can take a couple. This this is kind of interesting. I could take a couple dollars. I can mm -hmm. push this out, but mm -hmm. my priority is my voice, and I don't want yep. that to be tainted. Yep. And, and, and to that end, just on the on the business side of things, my my freelance work, my freelance illustration work, my freelance comic book work, the the majority of the stuff that I was doing was not in mainstream comics. It was for corporate entities, banks, Absolute Vodka, like all sorts of other brands that wanted to do comic book stuff. And there was way much, way more money in that business than there was in trying to draw pages for Superman, Spider-Man or whatever. So that's kind of the lane that I took. Because that lane funded me doing the books that I wanted to make. So I didn't, I wasn't out there trying to get a job at Marvel so that I could make my own stuff. I was out there working for whatever brands doing their uh, children's book, uh, you know, savings book, bank comic book, that's bank superhero, that sort of stuff, so that I could fund this other stuff that I was doing that was more personal to me. So that's where Witch Doctor came from, that other stuff. Funding your dream and funding your voice. Right, right. That makes sense to me. Go ahead, Urban. No, so I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking. I'm like, you know, so is that way like the way that you, 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 the route that you take in order to, to fund, um, to fund, you know, a lot of your personal projects. Like, so if I was a creator, if I'm a creator coming in, you know, I don't really know much about, you know, uh, comics, and you know, I'm wanting to know how I can get professionally involved, but I just want to be able to work professionally. You know, what do you think is the path to being able to to make a living creatively, you know, speaking? Making a living creatively speaking is is about supply and demand. If, if that's what you need to do, like if you need to pay your rent, you need to be doing whatever work people need to be done. 
that's not the lane that you want to put your dream into. Like if I've got this dream story that I've been thinking about in my, and I just want, I have to make this story happen. Don't put that in that lane. That's something that you are going to do on your own time. Cause if you let whoever get a hold of your dream, there's no telling where that's going to go. It, it might stop. You know, you, if, if you put it in that lane, you have to be willing for that dream to die basically. Um, which doctor was never something that I was willing to let die like that. So I never just, I was never out there trying to publish it with somebody else. I always had to publish that on my own. Okay. So in terms of like, which, which doctor did you have any, or do you have any desires for it to be, um, something that branches into other mediums, you know, such as like animation or, you know, um, any like uh, maybe book, you know, like novel storytelling. Yeah, I was, I was, I was interested, um, and I wouldn't be opposed to it. It, it, it's still something I'm, I'm working on. So yeah, I, I would definitely. I mean, at this point, we might be talking about the character living beyond me because I'm, I'm a little in my, my years. Uh, <laughs> but, but um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm more than happy. Yeah, animation, uh, games, especially you know some of the the cross platform stuff that we came in, cross promotional stuff that came out like Powerverse. Uh, I think there's a Witch Doctor card in there. Um, I, I would, I would, I would be more interested in talking about crossover with other creators before getting to the point of doing like like crossing into new media. So I'm actually I think there, there are other bridges that I could cross before getting into the, the larger bridge. So I'm happy you asked that because I that was actually another question I had. Like, you know, in terms of like collaborations, if you had to pick someone out there that you were to collaborate with that you haven't collaborated with already, who would you collaborate mm -hmm. with? Or is there, or you don't have to, it may be nobody, but I'm just curious, who would you collaborate well, with? Well, I think, I think there, there's a, there's kind of a chronology. There's like, First things first, I think I would need to collaborate with one of the original guys, like one of the pioneers, like Andre, like Witch Doctor Dreadlocks kind of thing, or, or Witch Doctor Horseman kind of thing. Like just letting those early characters kind of come together uh, would probably make the most sense. Um, and that would be a great place to start. But then there's, there's other there's other brands that are, that are coming out. Um, and then there's other writers and, and other creators that are work that are coming out. And so I don't know if, the, if those characters work together, but there's definitely talents that I would like to work with. Yeah. And I think that's, the, that's a beautiful thing to hear because I think it helps push the brands more when we collaborate, especially if it's an organic collaboration yeah. versus something that's forced. You know, just putting that groundwork. And I also like the fact you said about your legacy living on even beyond you. And I think that shows like any type of art or literature that if it can go beyond you, that means it really is a staple. And which doctor really is a staple, especially with the in the in the indie space in the black mm -hmm. creative space. You know, I think it definitely sets a tone for the rest of the creatives. And I was just curious, like. Could you like let us in a little bit on your actual creative process in creating a book or writing a story? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the, like one of the key elements of my creative process, and you might see it. I'm not gonna move the camera around because it'll probably fall over. But I try to be as immersive as possible when I'm in in my creative space. Like, um, I, I want to walk into a room that that has it all over the wall. Like, I want I want I want it dripping off the walls. I want I want the sound bouncing uh, out of my ears. Uh, so I, in addition to you know, you see comic books, posters, work that I've done for the past years so all over my walls. In my back wall, I have like a whole wall of um, my record collection. My record collection is very strange. It's not pop music. My record collection is all like horror movie soundtracks. So when I create, I'm I'm listening to horror movie soundtracks, not necessarily horror, but just a bunch of different soundtracks, not lyrics, just mood kind of music. So I'm not singing along to it, but you know, it's kind of building this kind of drama in my head, building this scene that I'm creating on the page. 
Um, so just very immersive. The lighting, um, just very immersive with, with the stuff that I want to do. Um, if it's if it's derivative of something, I mean, maybe if it's a a monster thing, I'm watching my favorite monster movies. I'm watching Godzilla. If it's an action thing, I'm watching my Kung Fu movie collection. I like to like take it in and then put it on the page. That's funny you said it because I I have a similar process um, when I'm creating. Like I like to like other things affect what I'm thinking about and how I'm able to process. So like whether it's music, other mediums, things that inspire you. But how do you like contain that to like stay focused on, you know, because I know we talked a little bit earlier and you spoke on not having like specific deadlines with your mm -hmm. actual mm -hmm. work. And how does that like play a role in like your creative process? There's a, a process called um, like thumbnailing. Like when I'm making a, let's say I'm making a, I guess it changes depending on what I'm creating. So if I'm making a book, I don't have any around. I'll do it like this. I'll take like a sheet of 11 by 17, fold it over and actually make a booklet. Just white paper. And just start scribbling. I'm not sure if I can show you. <laughs> Wait, hold up. Hold up. Eh, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, I actually created. This is something that I already created. published. So I'll, I'll scribble it out and I'll sketch the book out here in a, in a smaller format. And then I like to try to blow this up and then get it into my iPad. Because I like to work like there's an energy that you get from your first pencil sketches. When you first get that idea of like, oh, this is what I want that page to look like. I'm going to sketch it out right there, sketch it out. I want to blow that up. I want to redraw this. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to redraw this on another page. I want to blow this, this idea up right here. So I'll blow that up in a digital form. And then from there... I guess the the easiest way to describe what I what I do in a nutshell is I flatten it. I don't know every ten minutes. Like I don't know if you're working with Photoshop or if you're working any kind of app that has a whole bunch of layers. You might have a tendency to like five, ten, twenty yeah. layers at some point. You just switch <laughs> back and forth. And you forget which which layer there. There's there's a there's a certain freedom and a certain confidence and a certain energy that you get from smacking all them layers down and just, cause that's what it's going to be, right? Like it's, you're not going to see all these layers. You're going to see the final page. So at some point, like it, it moves you forward to say, no, just flatten all of it. And if it's not right, fix it on top. And that keeps you moving forward. That keeps you from choking on all of this and choking on the different layers. Hopefully that explains it no, it makes sense, especially as a fellow creative, like when you are going through that initial penciling process and finishing there and transferring it to digital and the layers and all of those things, it can be a lot. Mm -hmm. Versus just kind of getting to the task itself and saying, you know what? It's here now. Let's actually get this done versus I'd have made 15 layers. Right. And it's all nobody's going to know that part of the 15 right. layers. If you're a consumer, you're just going to grab the book look at the art, look at the dialogue, the whole nine yards mm -hmm. versus like, you're not going to know the meticulous process. So eventually you have to get comfortable with, okay, moving this on. is what I'm doing, moving yeah. on and not getting stuck because I know as artists, well, creators, I think get stuck on yeah. the particulars a lot. Yeah. And, and so that, that's probably my advice in terms of, of creative process. It's, it's more about um, finding ways to keep yourself moving forward. Um, moving forward, moving forward, and not getting caught up on the perfectionism of 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 what you think you should be doing. Okay, really quick, you know, before we get into this other part of this interview, got to make a quick little announcement, you know, and this is like our midway break. Right. Um, and let's see here, we have the Honeycomb Hideout. Um, it's a show by our. Um, uh, by the parent company, Imaginos Workshop, that's basically about, um, it's a, it's Howard Stern Career Geeks. So if you guys are into, <laughs> to, you know, listening to a podcast that is touching on, you know, anything in the industry, but, you know, it's more so just raw and informative and, you know, where people are just talking and shooting, you know, um, 
shooting the talk back and forth. Mm-hmm. You definitely mm-hmm. want to check out the Honeycomb Hideout. It is on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify. It's even on YouTube. So make sure you guys check it out. Um, there will be a link down below for you guys to check out as well for that. And also, one more um, shameless plug in. Uh, we do have our Origami Super Punch, which will be available soon online for you guys to view. So just go ahead and and um, you know be on the lookout for that. We'll have it online in our, our shops very soon. We'll have more information on that in the next coming weeks. But um, anyway, let's get back to our interview. All right. So next thing I kind of wanted to know, of course, we're talking about the creative process, but you have a lot of projects out there, especially even in Black Horror. Mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, people you know are talking about. Like, I kind of consider like I'm not sure if you're familiar with the comic, like Bitter Root, but yes. Bitter Root, mm-hmm. um, Crescent City Monsters. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you have a lot of projects out there like that. You know, that you know have caught a lot of attention. So, I'm curious. You know, of course, going back to you being a pioneer in the industry, what is your take? How do you feel about the state of black horror in comics right now? It, it, it's it's it has exploded. <laughs> it has exploded. Um, I have, yeah, I, I collected uh, Bitter Root. I collected Philadelphia for a while. I mean, I have all of them. I have all of Philadelphia. Um, there's a few of them. Dark Blood was a good one. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any ongoing, like, indie series in Black Horror. Because I know Bitter Root is image. Well, I guess Zombie Love. I guess Blackula was that was that's an ind- independent. Yeah, Rodney Barnes is probably doing the best stuff that's out right now. Um, yeah. What was the question again? The question is what is what is my uh, your what is your um, take or opinion on okay. the state of black horror okay. in comics? Right. And- okay, so I'm gonna say this. I'm trying to say this as diplomatically as possible because I don't mean any hate by this. It it just concerns me. And there's, there's a thing that happens, let's call it the Jordan Peele effect. It's that thing where, like, a black guy makes a really good horror movie, and so any other horror movie that comes out by a black guy either has to be like that guy's movie or it has to be by that guy. That's concerning. It's that kind of... that there can only be one of them kind of thing that's concerning about the state of, of black horror. Now I'm not saying that I don't like Rodney. I think Rodney's great. I think black is great. I think there need to be more than that. Um, I think more guys need to come out with more black horror. And I think there needs to be a tapestry of black horror. That's what I mean. That is a very no shade, no shade, no shade. No, I've got my black t shirt. I'm all, I'm all, I'm Team Rodney. I'm all for it. I'm just saying we need. No, more. we ask these tough questions on purpose, not because of shade, but we want to actually get the inside thoughts that you guys have, because it's. Not, I don't think it's just being honest, shady. Mm-hmm. To right. That you want black voices to be diverse and you want us to be organic, and a mm-hmm. lot of times I think a big and just being frank. It's like when one person does something really good or organic in our community, it's like people just jump on that and stay yep. on that. And you have to mimic that exact thing versus it being like an open door policy to let's just cre- we can continue to create in this genre or we get to use our voices organically. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. you think about other communities, um, just being honest, like when I think of manga, like if you not even just OEL, but specifically manga, it seems like they can create manga about food. They can create manga about martial arts. They can create manga about whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just Mm -hmm. one genre. Maybe you might see some of that, like, get popularized in anime, where it's a specific genre. But manga seems to be a lot more, like, okay, diverse in that way. And I think that it can be a concern for Black creatives if we can't get past just a specific archetype that's set that works. Because it feels like our voices get stifled. That's Mm -hmm. what I believe, too. So I just want to piggyback. I know that's not a question, but I think it opens up very important dialogue. And uh, speaking of dialogue, I know we did a shameless plug for Honeycomb Hideout, but I know you have a lot of projects that you do um, 
and I believe it was about was it recording? Because I know you have like a recording studio and yeah, here in here in town I have a we do public broadcasting. So we 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 can broadcast on the air. Uh we do all sorts of stuff. I had a TV show on for I don't know, seven, eight years. Um it was a horror show uh called Frankie and, and that stuff was on the air. Um art my artwork is on the air. I'd I'd be more than happy to put your show on the air is just a public broadcasting station, uh, FCC free, uh, the best kind there is. Oh man, thank you for that, and uh, we definitely will be honored. And it's just, I want to make sure that you got all your endeavors out during this Indeed. conversation because we want to make sure that we plug you the same way that we put the energy into everything else. So you know, to keep that inspiration going. Indeed, indeed. All right, so. How when you when you're working creatively, I want to go back to the creative process a little bit. Okay. Um, how long does it actually take to do a page? Because that's something I know it varies between creators, you know. So I'm I'm just curious, like, does it take you know a whole like average work day of eight hours, or is it something you yeah, can shorter? That, that, like for me, the goal would have been a, a page a day. Um like especially like in that because I can count I can count it like that because there was a certain point in my life when I was doing literal just pencil to ink on the page and that was the page um, and then there was some lettering that went on after that but that was the page and so you would you could easily track how much time you had spent on it in the digital era that can kind of change a little bit because there's so much kind of morphy morph change stuff you can do but I would think just in terms of like production wise just in terms of timeliness you probably want to do a page a day still like if you expect that book to come out within two months um you know 32 pages it's about a page a day um you can take longer but yeah you know where that gets you yeah and my question to that is how do you work through like artist fun because i know sometimes it's like is days you may not be inspired to get something done that day. How do you work around some of those barriers? So let's say I have a my whole, or at least some of my book kind of sketched out. For me, my process would be like, I'm going to go through and find the panels that are easy, big eyeball, um, silhouette shot, you know, uh, or even because I was I was doing like hand drawn like panels, so I'd go through draw all, all the panels out and get those real nice and and sharp. Do all of that kind of stuff that like the like the custodial work, like the work that you can kind of just mindlessly get through because you're just tracing this line, you're just you know putting a box here, you're just filling in this black area. Um, do that easy, easy stuff that you can kind of just move through uh, and and kind of plot it out so that, I mean, I don't know, track, uh, track your energy levels, like during the day, like when are you most energetic in drawing and kind of match your task list to those times. Um, I, I have my most energy like early in the morning. Okay, save that tough panel for early in the morning. Uh, you, you're slower at night, then yeah, do your your custodial work at night. Oh man, that's great advice. I'm definitely gonna take some of that because I never thought about it that way. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my list things, be, the things that are simple, like okay, you have to draw, let's say, a desk. You, you're just tracing this desk, like background yep. work versus you know perspective, and you know it might be a harder page that you may not have the energy for at that moment. So. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. I think that's great advice. That, yeah. That's how that's how I did it. That's how I did it. And that's, uh, and that's how I did it in instances where I was, like, up against the wall. Like, there was, like, one, <laughs> my worst, worst time I had to do, I had, like, 10 days I had to do, like, 14 pages full color. It was hell. But I did it. I mean, I did it. It wasn't fun, but I did it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, plot out, make a list, you know, and 
up oh, this hand needs to be fixed and you know this needs to be recolored and just keep working through your list plan your work and work your plan um admittedly it takes the fun out of it you know that that's probably the the, the bitter part of that pill is is to get through some of this, you might have to take the fun out of it. To get through some of this, you might have to face the fact that, yeah, it's not all, it's not all cool and laser guns and monsters. Sometimes it's, yeah, just hard work and nope, you can't go out. Nope, you can't watch The Walking Dead. Nope, you can't play uh, GTA. No, you got to finish these pages. So, Yeah. And sometimes, and I'll, I'll give you another one. Sometimes it's your diet. Sometimes hmm. it's that you're not getting enough sleep. Sometimes it's that you're just watching too much TV in general. Sometimes it's just about your daily habits that's messing up your creative mind. It's fogging you up. That's real talk. Oh, that's that's very informative because you don't even track your day to day as a creative. A lot of times you right. just create and don't realize why you slowed up. Yep, and so and 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 we are very we are very prone to think that what we do is magic, and it and it's not. It's a it's a human function. It's a function of our brain capacity. It's a function of our of our our our, our life and our our life habits. It's a function of what we eat. <laughs> it's a function of what we read. It's a function of the air that we're breathing, the water that we're drinking, et cetera, et cetera. It's it's a it's a human function, and. Yes, you have to kind of nurture the emotions of it, but you also have to nurture the physical uh, elements of it. You have to take care of your health. Mm. You, you have to mindfully take care of your health. That's, That's a very seasoned, seasoned answer that you don't really hear a lot of people talk about. So, And my question would be, like, as an independent like creator, what are some of the pros and what are some of the cons in general in that and just creating – the pros are that you're very free. Um, the pros are that you, you don't really have anybody to, to pull you back. The cons are that you can, you can push yourself too hard and you can go too far um, on purpose. Uh, like the, the stuff that I did with Witch Doctor um, was emotionally... Uh, What's the right word for it? Not toxic, but just, just, just very hard stuff that I kind of put my mind through to kind of figure out what this character was and, and, and where he had come from. Um, yeah. it, that, that sort of thing. And, and there's yeah. really, like, there's a, there's a safety that you have when you're, when you're working for somebody, when you're doing... Uh, commission or freelance work. There's a safety that you have because it's really their thing. It's it's a job, and you can kind of detach yourself from it emotionally. But when you're doing kind of your own kind of creative thing, and it, it depends on the type of stuff that you're doing. Like one of the the real big challenges that I've always had in my career is doing like children's books on Tuesday and then on Wednesday doing Witch Doctor. Mm. The back and forth from that is you know, um, it's just challenging. Is challenging because you don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to come up short on either end. I don't want a, a kid to read something that's not friendly and positive and fluffy. And I don't want witch doctor to be soft. So it, it's tricky to go back and forth between those things. But the 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 downside of of independent stuff is that you don't have those safeguards. Um, so you just got to be careful and. It, Back to what I was saying before, you have to check in with yourself. You have to check in with yourself because this it can be tricky because what you're doing is probably with the best intentions. Like it's probably your best intention to be a comic book artist and I want to make comic books, but you might need some balance. You know, you might need to <laughs> stay in check with your finances, stay in check with your lifestyle and make sure that you're not, you know, overblowing the hobby. You know what I'm saying? And and not being reasonable. The the, the reality of, of my life as a comic book guy is this is what I'm gonna do anyway. So if you if you have it in your heart, by all means, keep pushing. But you, you might not be famous, you know, you might not be, you know, you might not be rich from this stuff. That that's 
I would, I don't, I don't want to discourage anybody from, from trying to get their dollar, but I, I would just, I don't know if that's what the best interest is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that having lived my career, the best moments in my career have been moments like this where somebody tells me 30 years later, oh, I remember you from, from back then. When I was a kid, you gave me a comic book. That's the best stuff. Um, the checks, I've, you know, I've, I've cashed a check here or there. You know, that's not that's not what I did any of this for. So, and, and you'll get to the other end of your career, and, and I'm, I, I promise you, that's the stuff that you'll remember. You won't remember the numbers. So, with you, you mentioned, mentioned about, about children's, children's books, books and, and um, 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 doing like jumping from witch doctor to children's books and like the difference and kind of what that is. Is is there also like a different set of skills? that someone would need to do something like a children's book versus maybe doing, you know, um, a, a horror comic or, you know, just comics period, maybe, you know, with a different style. I would say yes. Um, but I think those, the difference is more about the market. Like children's books is, a, is extremely competitive market. <laughs> like it's extremely competitive. Like, like we think comic books is a competitive it's nothing nothing compared to children's books nothing compared to children's books like you can make a comic book and make a big splash with a comic book children's books is that it's like it's like a like a sink compared to the ocean there's so many children's books and there's so many children's books publishers comic books we got like two three four <laughs> this is a big business and um i don't know you just have to have a I guess a thick skin when I was doing children's books, I, um, I was never, I was never the guy that came up with the children's book. Like it wasn't, these were never my stories. These were people that hired me to do a children's book. And I would have to have a real, um, real like conversation with them. Like you, this isn't going to make you rich. Like you're, this is not, you're not going to be the next, uh, Dr. Seuss. You're not going to be those, this is not how that happens. You're not going to be the next J.K. Rollins, that sort of thing. Um, it's way too competitive for that. So that's, you just have to know the market that you're going into. That's the difference. In terms of like creatively, artistically, eh, it's pretty much the same stuff. And that's actually a good perspective. And I know you talked about how hard it was to, to go from, a children's book to which doctor how did you transition emotionally to keep yourself in check it, it wasn't fun man I, I i don't i don't want to give you an answer as if i had the right answer like there was one book i won't, I won't name i don't that book never even i don't think they, it never even came out which was which was even worse because i still did the work but just hated it like at, at, at some point I just hated this book, the children's book thing. Like, Witch Doctor is always my thing. So, you know, it's tough, but I got to do it. But this other thing, um, it's kind of a biography kind of thing. And by the time I got to the end of it, I just hated it. Hated doing it. Didn't, And it, it, it almost made me not want to do draw anything. Like, not want to just, I don't want to do anything. Because it was, you know, there's a deadline sitting on on top of my desk so i just have to avoid my desk entirely because now i don't want to i don't want to do anything in that whole area um so that was like so yeah that's my answer that's probably that's what happened that's not that's not how you should work through that sort of work um i guess the the better answer is learn to say no to work. i think so or get yourself in a position where you can say no. Um, I was in a position where I could have said no, but I didn't. Um, and I regretted that. So that, that would be my answer. I don't, I'm, I'm not suggesting that working through it is always the best solution. I think it goes back to what you said before. When you said about the right answer, it's not that. It's about checking in with yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, ca if you have the capacity to do it or not. Right. And 
it takes a level of, you know, self-awareness to even be able to address your own, you know, capacity. And thinking about not just capacity, you brought something up about like when you get older and you remember those stories, right? Um, mm-hmm. Like, oh yeah, I met you 30 years ago, 20 years ago, you did this for me, you inspired me, I'm into this class, that class. I was wondering what are some of your personal accomplishments that you really value? Um, being, you know, working on comics and just the, being in the creative space in general. What are some of your biggest accomplishments? Biggest accomplishments. Biggest accomplishments. Let me think. Let me say. Um, all right. I'm going to tell this story. Okay. So there was. It, it was a big. It's a big accomplishment just because, because of how far it reached and how far it went. And the other big thing for me was I knew it was going there before it went there, and I knew it so clearly that like when I got the call, I hung up the phone. I turned around to my wife and I said, "They're gonna make me do this." Now, they hadn't told me what they were going to make me do. When are you guys going to put this out? Um, right. In right. the next... Uh... Okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay, about, let's say, six years ago or so, there was this thing that was kind of... um. It was like a big thing in the in the government. Like, they were going to start this new program. And there was a guy that was in office that, that uh, I don't know. They you wanted can be to make, they wanted to they wanted to pitch an idea to this person. So the idea was to make a comic book. So they made this comic book. They got me to make this comic book. And I knew it before they, they made me do it. I knew I was gonna be making this comic book. So it was a Space Force comic book. And this was like before this whole thing kind of Blew up. And it was before they even told me anything about Space Force. But when I got the call, I'm like, you know what? They're going to make me do a Space Force down the road. So I went out to San Juan and I drew like 12 pages of this book and I never heard anything. I got to check the whole thing. Um, but I was there working with like Lockheed Martin. I was sitting in a room with like Department of Defense. It's a weird thing, but it, it was it just it was just one of those moments where art took me way out there, just way, way out there in a place where I never imagined I would have been. But there I was and I did this thing. And, and that's just I, I mean, I don't know if that's not the accomplishment, but I think that's that's the spirit of what you're asking me is like, yeah, that's, that's something that's you're proud I, of. Like, even if it's not like I don't that, know, kind of, proud, just... proud is a weird word. Proud is a weird word. I don't do pride too much. It's something that mm. happened, and I was very, very entertained by the whole thing. Um, yeah. the, the stuff I did with MTV was pretty cool, too. Like, just the stuff that, you know, I only ever wanted to draw my own comics. So, like, people paying me to draw their comics, you know, people paying me to draw Teen Wolf, which... You know, I grew up on Team Wolf. I, I love Team Wolf. I love Scott and those guys. It's great stuff. So people paying me to do that stuff. People paying me to do Space Force. Uh, just fun. You know, just icing on the cake. I'm glad you shared that story. I think that's <laughs> yeah. That's I'll, probably get a, I'll probably get arrested. Oh, we don't. It's want worth that. it though. It's fine. It's the truth. It's the truth. <laughs> I'll show you the pages sometime. It was a fun. Okay. It was a fun thing. It was a project. It was um, what was the name of that group? It's like a think group out in like Silicon Valley, and basically what they were doing was like um, basically making making books and projects and comics to inspire uh, like tech developers to make the next generation of technology and science and and you know that sort of thing so it was a it was a very fun project i did a few projects with them i did one with that and did one with like education um to talk about the future of education so 
it's fun to to use your art to inspire the future uh and we'll Absolutely. see what happens it's because it sounds like hum coming from humble beginnings to being able to see where you can go with your creativity. It's just, it feels good. It feels good. And it's also kind of scary to see how small the world is. Cause you know, you, you get there and you're like, why me? Like, aren't there like hundreds of other people that you could have, you know, tapped on the shoulder to, to get to do this? Uh, well, okay. I guess I'll do it. I can, I suppose. Okay. Well, we're we're getting ready to wrap up here, but before we wrap up, I'm gonna let Che ask whatever question you have, and then we'll ask you our traditional question. Okay. You know, our big question that we always ask here on Shining Spotlight. But Che, I'm gonna throw the ball over to you. Oh, no problem. Um, and I know you talked about, you know, just your experience in the creative space. And I was wondering, are there any particular young guys in in the industry or who are creating that you have been looking at specifically that you're like you know what i like what he's doing i like what he's doing i like what she's doing so i was wondering are there any particulars that you you know gravitated towards i, I mean I'm, I'm watching all the all the, I'm, I'm watching everybody um i'm watching everybody and i don't i don't want to leave anybody out fair but, enough um i'm watching jay hero just because Jay's doing great stuff, but Jay's also running up against like the struggle of working for the mainstream. And I see I see I see a role model in Jay. And I see I see I see other brothers that that, that need to look at, at, at how he's operating and look at what it might take because he's 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 at a crossroads right he's at a crossroads where he needs to decide whether or not he's going to keep trying to push to go into the mainstream or he's going to do his own thing and that's important like sometimes guys try to do both sometimes do one or the other um but that's the that's this is a critical moment in that guy's uh, art career. And it's, it's, it's just fascinating to, to be there to watch it, especially now that you can kind of see everything about an artist's career as it happens. Um, Danny Quick, um, Ace Blade, and, and the stuff that you guys got coming out from him and Morgan, and uh, um, to see a company, to see a group, a collective of, of talents, at their beginning and to be able to watch them develop. These are all just, I mean, it's just great to just see the the inspiration and see the intention to do it, just to see the hustle to want to do it. Um, Cause I mean, when we did it back in the day, it was cause it didn't exist really. Like there, there wasn't a dreadlocks. There wasn't a brother, man. There wasn't a, that wasn't a thing like there was marvel there was dc there were white superheroes and you got occasional black superheroes and you got red chicken and that's what you got you didn't get stuff that we made so we made stuff well okay now we we can see you guys doing it again and we can see how you're doing it and I, yeah i i'm i'm inspired once again I'm checking all these guys out. There's, there's, like I said, I don't want to forget anybody. Greg, Greg Elise, uh There's too many names. There's too many names. Um, the stuff that they're doing with the uh, Epiphany Engine, and you know, see, if I if I got if I forget somebody's name, somebody will get mad at me. So, <laughs> no, understandable. Uh, but I'm watching all of y'all. If there's anybody I forgot, let me know. I'll watch them too. Well, we appreciate that. So now. We're going to ask you the big question. The big you know, question. The oh, yeah. You know, we have to go with, you know, and it's funny that they just had a little Marvel announcement. But this, this, the, the title, the, the question is more, what is your end game? Meaning, what, when you look at the span of your whole career, you know, obviously, you know, you're still in your career. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. how do you want your career to be? by its end you know when it's when someone looks at it if they were to look at it like this was the career of kenji 
Yeah, yeah. How do you how do you want it to be viewed? What is your actual goal at the end of it? I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about it in terms of like the third act, the third, the third act of, of Kenji comics. And I think there is one more foray into let's just say Afrofuturism. Like I think Afrofuturism is the like I did horror, I did children's books, I did album covers. Um, I think Afrofuturism is the 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 final frontier uh, for for Kenji artwork. There's some ideas that I have in development, um, and that's how I would want to wrap it up, so to speak. Not to mention, um, I guess getting back out there on the road and hitting up these conventions again and selling some books around. The other uh, arm that I want to uh, employ in conventions is all of these um, sketch covers that I, I've, I've spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on sketch covers. So I want to just draw on these sketch covers and just sell these books out at rock bottom prices so that everybody can have a little Kenji comic of their own, whether it's Black Panther or Storm or I got all these other comics. So I'll just draw on the cover and that way you can have a Kenji comic and it'll be a Kenji Black Panther or a Kenji whatever. Kenji will do Marvel comics. Finally, finally, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, that's cool. so that's I guess that's my final act. But uh I don't know. I don't know. Do I ever do I ever go away? I'll stick around. I'm yeah. always gonna have something to say, I'm sure. And we appreciate that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on Shine and Spotlight today. You know, we really thank appreciate you guys. It. Don't be strangers, and, and, let's keep in touch. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Before, before we go though. We would like for you to give, you know, um, you know, let everybody know where can they find you. If let's say someone's like, you know, hey, I've never, you know, actually, uh, you know, read Witch Doctor. I want to be able to pick up a copy, you know, mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. you know, any new projects you have going on. Like, um, you know, can you go ahead and let us know where we can actually find you at and follow you? I'd say check me out at, at Kenji.com. Check me out on Facebook. It's probably an easier way to, to, to keep up to date. Uh, on Instagram is Kenji underscore TV. That's probably even more up to date stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't think I have anything that I want you to check out right now, but I'm more inclined to have you just kind of turn your back and think I'm not around and then I'm going to sneak up on you with something. Uh, that's my style. I'm not going to try to telegraph no punches, but when it happens, it's going to happen and it's going to happen. There we go. <laughs> well, we thank you for we're just glad you came on. We're definitely going to stay in touch and we're, it's just good to see you and it's good to have you back. And, you know, we'll be around. We'll be all right. So. And then for all of you guys out there who enjoy Shining Spotlight, you know, obviously make sure you share this video around, you know, um, you know, and do just like Kenji said. Well, I guess you won't know when it's coming. You know, you'll never nope. see it coming. Nope. So. But when it comes, it comes. Yep, but let it happen. If as for our next episode, that should be in the next few weeks. So be on the lookout for that. There'll be an announcement for it. So thank you guys for watching. You know, and we will catch you guys later. Make sure you like the video too. You know as well. So thank you guys, and we'll see you guys later. <laughs>